The Maya saw this phenomenon as a manifestation of the deity Kukul Khan, the feathered serpent. The Mayas were able to actually record, you know, the equinox. That day in the year where night and day, you know, last the same. Every year, March 21st, you see the descent of Kukul Khan. Surrounding El Castillo, the civic buildings took on a new characteristic, spaciousness, with a broad open plaza, temples, marketplaces, a ball court, and colonnades. So the colony hall not only house uh, this, you know, the feasting events, but maybe individuals were brought into the plaza. You know, the general public was probably invited, depending on the occasions, to come to the plaza and witness the arrival of these, you know, uh, traders, uh, the merchants. Greek or Roman in appearance, these round columns were used as a new type of structural support and were an architectural first in the Maya world. The benefit of a column is that it allows you to create flat roofs. You're not investing all of your energy in creating stone buildings that are going to be containing corbel vaults, which may or may not collapse. The columns were simple in design. Round drums were placed one on top of the other, filled with rubble in between. A square section was placed at the top, and then flat rooftops made of stucco and wood were added to form expansive covered interiors. It involves people more openly in the life of, what, of the building and of what's happening within it than would have been possible with Maya pyramids of the full classic period. Those pyramids are mostly about exclusivity. It's about showing a space, holding it up high, but allowing very, very few people to look into it. The open column structures are much more inviting. But the welcoming atmosphere didn't last long. After more than 200 years of domination over the Yucatan, Chichen Itza suffered a fate similar to its neighbors in the south. It mysteriously collapsed. When the Spanish arrived on the shores of the Yucatan Peninsula in 1517, every large cosmopolitan center of the Maya world had been abandoned. Even so, a splintered Maya civilization, living in small villages across the countryside, put up a sustained fight against the conquistadors. They proved difficult to conquer because rather than taking a king captive or an emperor, as they did with the Aztec, they had to conquer one village at a time. And once they moved on to the next village, there'd be one behind them that would then uh, begin to rise in revolt. Maya warriors killed conquistadors by the thousands, but their weapons proved useless against a more potent enemy, disease. Within 100 years, 90% of the population of the New World was gone. The Maya who survived faced further persecution. Friar Diego de Landa had been sent from Spain to convert the Maya to Christianity, and he ruthlessly enforced his religious teachings. Diego de Landa was a young idealist who came to the New World trying to save souls, trying to win converts to what he referred to as the one true faith. But the Maya didn't believe that they should instantly and forevermore reject all of their own beliefs. On July 12, 1562, Landa ordered an auto de fe, or burning of the Maya texts, believing they were the writing of the devil. This was the end of thousands of years of accumulated knowledge of Maya civilization, one of the great tragedies in human history. In a lucky twist of fate, four codices survived the inferno and wear and tear of time. By the 19th century, some of these books that happened to escape the clutches of these friars and their destructive urges began to make their way into public attention. Today, their survival story is just another mystery in the complex history of the Maya. The fact that they were able to sustain an urban civilization in the rainforest for 1,500 years through all sorts of logistical and, and other challenges is one that we should admire and one from which we can stand to learn a great deal. 
Just as the Maya looked from the ground to the sky for guidance, we are now looking from the sky to the ground for answers. In recent years, NASA and the University of New Hampshire have been experimenting with remote sensing technology to see if they can determine where undiscovered cities might be hidden. Mounds of earth covered in trees that appear on readings may actually be ruins of ancient cities that have not been touched for centuries. More answers to the Maya mysteries may be right beneath our feet. My archaeology is just beginning. There are innumerable cities, innumerable temples, innumerable settlements that we have not been able to study and excavate. I think we're entering a golden age of my archaeology, and I can only see in the next century a time in which this will become one of the best understood civilizations of the ancient world. We now know that the Maya were an innovative and creative and majestic people with their own particular taste for violence. But what is the real allure of the Maya? What is this mystique that draws generation after generation the world over to this complex and sophisticated civilization? Is it the architecture with its serene palaces and temples or the intricacies of hieroglyphs and art in a complex writing system? Or is it the astounding comprehension of astronomy and mathematics with the concept of zero unparalleled in antiquity? Or is it simply because these remarkable people carved entire cities, not just villages and towns, but magnificent cities right out of some of the most inhospitable landscape in the entire world? In the rainforest between Honduras and the Yucatan, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of Maya sites that are untouched. In Palenque alone, there are 1,500 buildings that lie unexcavated, including temples larger than that one. And if you consider the archaeological treasures yet to be found in cities like Tikal and Chichen Itza, I say, and I'm sure I'm not alone, that the real allure of the Maya the real magic and mystique of this civilization are the mysteries that still lie buried deep within this jungle. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel.